First of all, thank you for, for asking me to be with you today. Um, and uh, also for all of those uh, who've, whose work has brought this uh, astonishing, actually, achievement uh, in such a short time of, of raising not just the profile of AKA, but, but actually AKA bringing forward solutions uh, to change uh, and improvement. Uh, I'd like to come back to that in, in, in a little while. Uh, but before I go any further, um, uh, I just would like to just publicly acknowledge the, the leadership and the fortitude of, of Richard Fluck in bringing this not only to the attention of, of the health service across England, uh, but also being able to marshal the forces in this room uh, in such an effective way to, to bring about such change. So, uh, so Richard, I'd, I'd just like to thank you first of all before I start. Uh, uh, you know and I know this wouldn't have happened unless uh, he was uh, at its helm uh, from, the, from the outset. Uh, now that calls another question to mind for me, is why does it take a hero uh, to bring to the attention of the system um, uh, the rationale for change? Uh, why do we rely on heroes to do that without having a systematic approach behind and supporting uh, the system to change when we know it's the right thing to do. Um, and I'll come up with a couple of examples, I think, about why we need to challenge ourselves as a clinical set of professionals, but also challenge ourselves as patients and the public as well to work together and align ourselves in this journey towards uh, an approach to quality improvement that not just looks at our, ourselves as uh, being very effective, uh, very efficient, uh, very safe uh, and, and really understanding the needs and experience of the patients that we serve. But also, what is it in that quality model that brings together how we are actually adding value to our system by the efforts that we do, that's patients as well as clinical professionals, but also how do we bring together and align the values of the individuals within those systems um, and particularly within this system. Uh, because it's only by aligning those values that we'll, we'll actually create a sustainable, resilient model uh, that's very reliable. Uh, I'll come back to that, uh, I think, in the end. So we've known in acute kidney injury that there is an issue for a long time. We also know that um, uh, uh, most of us don't know where, where, where urine is made. Um, I think that's changing uh, by your work. Uh, but we also know uh, that we've known what to do for a while. Um, uh, and this has resonance with so many other harms that occur in the hospital setting, uh, in the acute setting, um, where we've concentrated probably for far too long in acknowledging what goes wrong in healthcare in hospitals. Um, what we're starting to learn now, and I think it's through the work of, of many in this room, but uh, many in other uh, uh, groups who've supported certain other elements uh, of change that are required, whether that's uh, across harms in falls and pressure ulcers, whether it's uh, across harms that happen uh, in nutrition and hydration failings, whether it's harms that occur across in sepsis uh, 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 and others. Um, we've known what to do for a long time. It's often the driver from the public and the patients uh, who brought ourselves as clinical professionals uh, to account uh, for coming up uh, with solutions and answers for this. Uh, and I'll make no apology that, uh, that I'll show you a slide uh, shortly, which actually shows that it's not just uh, the public, but it's uh, a whole political will that is determined uh, and need necessary to get a sustainable change uh, in our system. And it's very salutary as clinical professions that we have to acknowledge that we often don't stand up when we should do uh, to acknowledge what needs to be done and needs to be changed. So I think we need to reflect on, on, on that. Um, so what is it about ourselves as a system um, that requires us to continually look at, uh, at change and improvement? Um, and in particular, if I could sort of reflect on AKI as the, as the subject matter uh, for this, because this, this is a sort of generic slide that we could put up uh, in many, many, uh, many other, uh, other different um, uh, arenas. Um, but as I said this, uh, earlier, this is not just an issue for uh, acute hospitals. This isn't an issue, an, an issue for wherever, wherever patients uh, and, uh, are resident. Uh, we concentrate on hospitals in this country. We're now learning that we need to concentrate on primary care. 
and increasingly on where the majority of often our patients are in, in either at home or in community settings. Uh, we have an increasing uh, population of, of 600,000 beds across the care home sector where we know a lot of patients uh, who are signaling systems for acute kidney injury uh, are, are resident. Uh, and we must be stealing ourselves for uh, offering opportunities for improvement uh, in that particular sector uh, uh, in particular. But I think I'd like to return uh, uh, a little bit to, to this program and the aims that the program had uh, in terms of, of its key, key issues. Uh, and these key issues are key pieces. Uh, we looked earlier, Richard put up the change model. Uh, key elements of that change model uh, rely, rely on measurement, key elements of measurement, uh, key opportunities, signaling for, for change, uh, and leadership uh, with any local system for change. Uh, and so the, the, the achievements that you've created through the Think Kidneys program has demonstrated that yes, you need leadership and, and sets of ambition, if you like, at a national level, but that can only work by local leadership uh, and local consistent measurement uh, of change and improvement. Uh, and so, so I think you've succeeded absolutely in terms of the, the establishing the data flows. You've succeeded in, in bringing together clinicians and the public uh, to understand uh, a little bit more, uh, not, a, not, not everything, but a little bit more about change and about what is needed for change. Uh, and the question earlier on about how do you reflect on the learning from this program into other, other programs of change to reduce harm and improve reliability uh, is absolutely pertinent. So we need to grab the lessons that, that, uh, that you've learned with Richard and take that forward to, to, to some of our other programs. And I'll share with you a couple of ideas for, from that uh, later. But again, I think what I'd like to reflect upon is that uh, often it's patient safety issues uh, that come to the fore because we as, we as doctors uh, and nurses and all clerk professions make mistakes. We've all made mistakes and we will continue to make mistakes while uh, we're allowed to, if you like. Um, so we need to create systematic approaches to reducing that chances of, of, of error uh, in our work. But also we need to learn from what goes right, what is done well in any system, uh, whether it's in a particular small system in, 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 in England or whether it's a, uh, a particularly global system somewhere else. We need to learn from each other and share uh, ruthlessly uh, on that and learn how to embed and learn how to implant uh, and learn how to create the resilience uh, solutions for this. My example here is another uh, harm uh, that was identified and it was identified uh, really through uh, a pressure group of patients uh, who contacted their GP, their MPs uh, rather than GPs. Their GPs probably uh, would have been interested, but probably would have uh, worried at the time about whether they could do anything about it. But this, this coalition between uh, patients and MPs brought to the attention of, uh, of many of us uh, the burden uh, of harm from venous thromboembolism. You can see here on this slide, I'm not going to go through it, but it demonstrates in a sort of graphic way uh, the journey that, it ca that uh, those who wanted to improve and reduce harm from venous thromboembolism uh, took probably about 10 years uh, to create a sustainable model where business as usual means that every patient who goes into hospital, which is a key, a key opportunity for venous thromboembolism to occur, uh, uh, has a risk assessment. So now we are doing over 18 million risk assessments on patients who uh, go in and out of hospital uh, for venous thromboembolism. That is now driving, that's uh, driving a change uh, in terms of reducing both harm from VTE, but also in reducing deaths from VTE. And there are many now large scale studies demonstrating that impact. So the learning from me on this program, we took and we supported Richard in terms of uh, some of our interventions for uh, the Think Kidneys program. The salutary lesson for me on this program uh, was in 2010. Um, uh, we knew what the right thing to do. We knew that we should be risk assessing patients when they go into hospital. But why was it that only about 40% of patients were being risk assessed, despite the fact that there was a, there was a nice guideline on this? Uh, uh, there were many attempts, uh, both publicly and through the system, to do this. But it, create, it took the, uh, the only thing that really got people uh, wound up to do this appropriately was the introduction of a sequin, an incentive payment. 
uh, within six months of that being launched, 95% uh, of all patients uh, across uh, England were being risk assessed because suddenly the directors of finance in the local systems understood that there was extra finance available. Um, we can go into lots of discussions about how that money was used and was it used effectively, but it suddenly kick-started the approach for risk assessment. What is it about our system um, in terms of patient safety and patient safety improvement uh, that we need to bring together and harmonize? This, these are three elements here uh, that we are working towards to produce a whole systematic approach to reducing uh, the burden and harm uh, of uh, avoidable harm uh, and death that occurs in our health system. And that's across from primary care uh, through our hospital system and social care system. Uh, we think there are three main areas to concentrate on. Uh, we need to understand more about what goes wrong uh, across the whole of the, uh, our, our system. Uh, and we use reporting systems to do this. Um, uh, we heard earlier that we've got the largest database now of acute kidney injury in the world. Uh, we also, England, also has the largest database of, of reported harms uh, uh, it, from any other system in the world. 1.8 million reports are made by the staff of the NHS every year uh, about things that could be improved. Uh, and we remorselessly use that data uh, to look at uh, how we could reduce harm uh, to benefit our patients and our systems and our staff. Uh, so, so we need to un increase our understanding about what goes wrong. We need to improve the capability and capacity to, to improve. Uh, um, and this particular program has demonstrated the power that can be brought together by looking at all the different elements uh, of those who are involved uh, in acute kidney injury. But we use the same model uh, and we're using the same model for, for other uh, elements as well. What is different now, I think, is certainly over the last five years is uh, and Hope, hopefully longer in some areas, but I know it isn't, it's more difficult in some areas, but the power of the patient and the power of the family in helping support change uh, is massively under, underused. Uh, and we must consistently approach ourselves that when we're looking at capacity and capability building, that includes families and, and, and patients uh, as well. And then also we, we need to, to look more uh, at, at what we're doing to tackling some of the underlying barriers uh, for widespread safety improvement. Uh, the use of candor, uh, the use of sharing information, the use of transparency, the use of public reporting of, of, of data, the real understanding of what the business case is uh, to elevate the conversation about how we can sustain and, and create sustainable uh, solutions uh, for safety improvement. Uh, what is the business case? What is the, uh, the added value? Or what is the waste uh, in, in having to do things two or three times when we know that if we did it the, the right way the first time, uh, that would be a much more effective way of doing it. So, so we're looking to create and sustain a model uh, that develops a, a significant uh, game changer in terms of safety improvement across England and the NHS across England. And I think we've done this uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, this is a graphical representation of a number of different elements uh, that, will be, that bring together and are currently uh, uh, fairly active uh, in, this, uh, in this approach. And I, and, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, uh, but absolutely at its core is trying to understand the responsibility of the individual uh, in their journey for, Im uh, for improvement uh, and the responsibility uh, of the system within which that individual works to be able to support uh, effective and appropriate improvement uh, wherever that organization is, whether it's a general practice, uh, whether it's a care home, uh, whether it's a tertiary center uh, doing world-class world research, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's wherever that takes place, whatever setting. So more congratulations for this program. Um, so without this program, uh, we wouldn't be seeing that we have now a signaling system for AKI. Uh, we wouldn't have seen uh, that we now have evidence uh, that re medicines reviews are taking place. Uh, and without this uh, system, we wouldn't now have a, uh, a, a testing system uh, that is now becoming embedded across, uh, across the NHS in England. Um, and you can see from this slide uh, that this is an increasing impact uh, uh, since the, uh, Richard designed and developed uh, the sequin alongside those in NHS England to deliver this change. Uh, Sequins as an incentive payment are there to challenge the local system to come up with solutions to put in place to be able to create change 
and sustain that change. Uh, they're not there forever. Uh, they're there to stimulate change uh, and provide some innovative solutions for change. Uh, I think it's a salutary experience that it takes sequins often to make a difference. Uh, but the real issue then is how does the local system maintain that approach in year two, three, and onwards so that it becomes business as usual? Uh, part of that process, I think, is the absolute transparent approach to publishing data and sharing data and recognizing uh, that there is unwarranted variation across our systems. Uh, if now we know the right thing to do is, why don't we all do them? And we may come on to that for questions later. So what else needs to be in place to drive uh, an innovative solution? Well, uh, we are very effective, I think, in this country about using an alerting system that is an effective system that builds on evidence uh, and uses that evidence to demonstrate what change could take place if simple rules were followed. So the use of evidence-based approaches to, to alerting uh, is a key part of, uh, of improving the safety of our system. And this is a transportable uh, system. The, these alerts that uh, the, uh, the NHS in England produces uh, are used across the world by many uh, developed countries uh, as their own, as in, in most of the developed countries, the, it's the only alerting system that is in place. So they, they steal the system and they use it uh, remorselessly. But increasingly it's used in low and middle income countries to help as a resource package uh, to support change uh, and innovation in low and middle income countries where often they don't have the governance systems that may, we find sometimes, um, given the comments about asking permission, uh, uh, I'm one of the worst uh, advocates of that because I, I always ask for forgiveness afterwards being a simple country. Uh, uh, Catholic boy, you know, or forgiveness is easy. Uh, so, uh, so my my attempts uh, in this world is to is to ensure that we do share as much of this information. Uh, and the governance in some of the lower middle income countries allows them to rapidly change systems. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit more in the developed countries to persuade people uh, that good improvement can take place very quickly. So remorseless use of alerting, remorseless use uh, of data to demonstrate what could be done. Um, now, your database here is an astonishing achievement um, that you've pulled together something that very few other, uh, other uh, interested groups, if I could say, use that word in, in the best way possible, have, you've managed to persuade laboratories, you've managed to persuade local systems to come together and collect data against a common data set and then produce it and then actually be able to use that to demonstrate that change has taken place. That's an incredible example uh, that we need to use and foster, and we will be doing that. Um, uh, you know, I'm a, a sort of a, a person who steals with pride uh, and then uses it uh, remorselessly elsewhere. So we will be using this, and, and, uh, and uh, Richard, there's nowhere for you to go because uh, we know where you live, so um, you'll be used as well for this. So this is an astonishing achievement, uh, again, for this, for this group. We talked earlier a little bit about... Um, well, the STPs, uh, what's the role of capability and capacity in terms of, of what are the footprints likely to be in terms of, of, of the health system, with regards, particularly as far as safety and, and quality improvement are concerned? There are two elements here uh, that I just want to share with you. We talked one, uh, mentioned one earlier about the patient safety collaboratives. Um, I think Ron mentioned it in, 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 in the video. Uh, uh, we've also got Q, the Q Fellowship. So, the patient safety collaboratives is the system response, the system, um, uh, local system offer uh, for uh, sustainable improvement uh, in, in safety across the whole system uh, in every sector and every setting. We have 15 collaboratives uh, ac across England covering the whole 55 million population. Uh, this was hard won. Uh, the funding to support this is a five-year program. Uh, we're just starting year three. Uh, uh, those programs are now starting to deliver incredible and innovative change in terms of local systems. And that's not just on the technical elements uh, of reducing harm, but on some of the really uh, fundamental elements of understanding the human factors behind, uh, uh, behind safety improvement. Uh, and so I, I'd applaud them, but I'd also ask you to really engage with your local systems of safety collaboration uh, uh, across all the systems. A second element is it was the offer for 
for by, through Q, uh, which we first of all called the 5,000 Patient Safety Program. Um, this came out of work that we did with, with Don Berwick to look at how we could improve at scale the safety of patients across England. Uh, and that was to invest in 5,000 Patient Safety Improvement Fellows over a five-year period. Uh, it's an incredible achievement. Uh, we're now uh, just coming up to our first thousand, uh, uh, and uh, within the next year we'll be nudging the 2,000. So we've only got 3,000 to go, but we will get there uh, within the next uh, two to three years. Uh, the value of Q, and Richard is a Q participant, member, um, scholar, fellow. Uh, uh, the value of the, this program is that it offers a unique opportunity to have excellence in quality improvement and a known excellence in quality improvement at a very local level to support the trusts and support the organizations from which the Q Fellows are going to be embedded. But it also offers, at a much larger scale, uh, the work to help support faculties through the collaboratives, to use, use it to develop communities of practice across England for notable elements, of which AKI is one, and I know that, that Richard Isley is helping support a, a group in that area. But also, it creates a national faculty of, of quality and safety improvement uh, for England to then uh, reflect on itself but also to help support uh, others, um, not just in, in the devolved administrations, but also across uh, Europe and the rest of the world where it's needed. But first of all, its first priority is to help support its local organization and its local system. There are many clusters uh, that are uh, helping support uh, work as, as collaboratives come together. Uh, this is just a demonstration of an earlier uh, cluster that reflected on, on the use of, of its techniques and ability to look across uh, many different populations on acute kidney injury. Uh, these are re-evaluating re their roles, I think, and, and reframing quite rightly. Um, uh, the, the current administration in the U.S. is, is, uh, is thinking about, was thinking about repeal, um, review and repeal. It's now, I think, re review, uh, review and repair, I think, is the current issue. I think we need to re reframe ourselves often uh, in some of the, the elements we're doing. So reframing how we how we look and, uh, and approach the use of the collaboratives in getting seismic change is going to be key for us to do. So looking forward to hearing from them on that. But the other element that you've demonstrated is, is that you have to have collaboration to succeed in developing a, uh, a future resilient system. Uh, and the other example that therefore that you have demonstrated is that you've done that. You've done it at scale too. This isn't just something that you've done within a, a few of you. Uh, you've done it across the whole country, you've done it in many different sectors, and you've done it in many different settings, and in particular, uh, you've done it in that area where we're really struggling to understand how we can, how we can engage effectively, uh, and that's in the social care setting, uh, where increasing numbers of our patients and, um, and public will be, will be sitting. So thank you very much for that as well, another example of what we can do. Other sequence that are in place, and I think I'd rather talk about the conditions rather than the sequence, but we end up falling into this sort of trap sometimes about what's working well, so let's use that. So uh, sepsis uh, and uh, AMR are two elements uh, that are really vital in terms of our battle uh, with you uh, in reducing acute kidney injury. Um, and often uh, a number of co uh, coexisting signaling systems from, from our patients uh, that these are happening. So incredible advances uh, in uh, our approach uh, to sepsis um, with the introduction of a sequin, looking at appropriate uh, interventions, timely interventions. Uh, and I, you'd, I'd have to pay due homage here to the Sepsis Trust, uh, who like you and the organization supporting thick kidneys have done an incredible work as well uh, through the work of, of Ron Daniel and others, but also the patients in that environment are the ones who brought this to the fore. Again, it's the dynamics of patients and their families who help, uh, who help move and create sustainable change. So big changes in support and improvement through, through uh, the AKR and sepsis. Uh, our plans are increasing uh, on this basis now in doing a joint, sepsis, a joint sequin uh, with sepsis and AMR to reduce the burden not only in terms of inappropriate antibiotic prescribing, but also to look really hard and closely uh, at those gram-negative infections uh, that are really, really, really starting to uh, uh, create a very different dynamic for patients who suffer harm from infection. Uh, 
We, we have a controlled system, I think, in terms of MRSA and C, C. diff now. We are not in a controlled system with regard to gram negatives, particularly the rising tide of E. coli and Klebsiella. And that is a key signaling area for us to, to concentrate our efforts and work on. And so we have a, a two-year sequin uh, uh, in place uh, from this year uh, to look at uh, helping support the reduction in those arms. Uh, I make no, no forgiveness. I don't ask for forgiveness for this slide. Uh, I think it's a really important element. Uh, and it's, some, it's a slide I often use when I'm, when I, when I'm finishing. Avedis Donabadian is one of, my, one of my heroes. I hope that you start to, to read his work. Um, he, was the, he was the man who developed the concept in, in medical education about, about uh, structure and process. If you get the right structure, the right process, you improve your outcomes. But he also believed... Uh, as I do, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that it's, it's the ethical principles of the individuals within a system that really create a dynamic but also a resilient system uh, that will inevitably then be able to survive the buffeting that goes on uh, in change whenever change models take place. So my thanks to you is that you've demonstrated that the ethical principles of coming together are the ones that have created a sustainable movement for you and Think Kidneys. Uh, the love that I talk about and the love that Avedis uh, talked about um, was not the soft, fluffy um, uh, love. Um, the Greeks have four different, five different elements, I think, about how they talk about love. He talked about this is the, this is the love that is a commitment love. This is the love that, that you support your team, your team supports you. You support your patients, your patients support you. Uh, it's a sustainable uh, love, and I think that's one that I'd like to, to think uh, that you've demonstrated in spades uh, for us in your program. So congratulations again for everybody, um, uh, and I think I'll close at this stage.